to the UP Center for Women's and Gender Studies and the UP SIDS Decolonial Studies Programs webinar, Healing Power of Postcolonial Indigenous Women, Lessons from Aita Women Healers in the Philippines and Implications by Dr. Rose Ann Torres. This event is part of the UPCWGS lecture series, Site of Convergence, Weaving Tapestries of Knowledge. We would like to remind all the participants of this webinar to again use the Q&A function instead of the chat to send in your questions. You can send the questions anytime during the lecture and they will be answered during the open forum at the end of the lecture. Also, as this is an event and not an official training, we are not issuing certificates to participants. To start our program, let me call on UPCWGS Director, Dr. Natalie Africa Verseles for her opening remarks. Magandang araw po sa ating lahat. I hope all of us are doing well and managing our frustrations well amidst the intensifying pandemic. Thank you all for being here. On behalf of the UP Center for Women's and Gender Studies and the UP Center for Integrative and Development Studies, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this virtual session of Site of Convergence, Weaving Tapestries of Knowledge, wherein we feature research studies on women and gender by various scholars. In our last session, we listened to five presentations by our research grantees. This morning, we are very fortunate and grateful to have with us Dr. Rose Ann Torres, who is based in Canada. That's why we started the webinar very early at 9 a.m. And is with the University of New Brunswick. Dr. Torres and I, Trivia Lam, were classmates when we were doing our MA at the Department of Women and Development Studies two decades ago. It is only now that we have reconnected so it is really a happy and scholarly reunion. Dr. Torres will present on the healing power of post-colonial indigenous women, lessons from Aita women healers in the Philippines, um, lessons and implications, and implications, which is based on her PhD dissertation at the University of Toronto. We are aware that indigenous women's experiences are shaped by the simultaneity of their being women and indigenous. And oftentimes this intersects with being low income as well as with other marginalized identities. Thus, we welcome the focus on the power of Aita women, in particular their healers from a post-colonial perspective. Indigenous and traditional healing practices are marginalized and even discredited by dominant approaches and in this session, we highlight and honor these practices as well as the women who perform them. The best opening remarks are short, so I'm sure we are all excited to hear from Dr. Torres. I wish all of us a most edifying morning. Maraming salamat at magandang umaga po. Thank you so much, Dr. Natalie Verseles, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you so much for having me this morning. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Um, Dr. Torres, you have to be introduced pa. May introduction kami to you. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> you know I'm excited. really getting excited. Okay. I'm really getting I thought I'm, it's my turn. I'm sorry about that. Go on, go on. Sorry pa. Uh, delayed po yung aking pag enter again um so i'll thank you ma'am natsi and i will be introducing dr rose ann torres so dr rose ann torres has a phd in sociology and equity studies and education and women and gender studies from ontario institute for studies in education of the university of toronto she is currently an assistant professor of sociology in the Department of Social Science at the University of New Brunswick in St. John, Canada. Dr. Torres' research interests include decolonization, transnational studies, indigenous epistemologies, sociology of health, race, gender, and work, social movements, Asian, Canada, Canadian studies, and reflexive research methodologies. She has co-edited a book on critical research methodologies, ethics and responsibilities 
in 2021. She has two forthcoming books co-edited with her graduate students on outside and in between, theorizing Asian Canadian exclusion and the challenges of identity formation uh, from Brill Publishing. And uh, another one, uh, Asian, Can Ca Asian Canada is Burning, Theories, Methods, Pedagogies, and Praxis from Fernwood Publishing. She is currently co-editing a book on critical reflexive research methodologies uh, with University of Calgary Press. She also published numerous book chapters and articles on Ita women healers. Dr. Torres is the principal investigator of two research projects called Caring for Others, Caring for Others and Uncaring of the State, the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health of Filipino healthcare workers in Canada and the role of indigenous healers in addressing COVID-19 pandemic. So again, let us call on Dr. Rose Antares. Hey ma'am, you're muted po. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you so much. Maraming salamat, uh, Dr. Versales, Jasmine, for uh, that introduction. Uh, but before I will uh, uh, introduce my study, I would like to acknowledge the land that I am in at the moment. So the city of Toronto acknowledges that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Hondiseni, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Meti peoples. The city also acknowledges that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the William Treaties signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Uh, I have a very long list of agenda, but before I will tell you my agenda for this morning, I would like again to acknowledge uh, Dr. Natalie Versales, Dr. Marie Aubrey, Vilia Seran, Dr. Rowena Leguiles, Jasmine, and of course, all of you. Marami pong salamat sa iyong pagdalo ngayong uh, umaga at marami pong salamat sa uh, iyong oras um, at uh, pakikinig sa akin. So, <laughs> ang aking Tagalog ay um, mas magaling ako sa Ilocano kaysa sa Tagalog kaya medyo uh, baluktot ang aking Tagalog. But I'll try my best to um, again... Uh, uh, speak in Tagalog other than Ilocano because I'm, I'm really fluent in my uh, dialect, which is Ilocano. But for this presentation, first, uh, I have several agendas that I want like to uh, finish for this morning. First is implicating the self, who am I in relation to the Aita women? I will discuss also the aim of my study, the research problem, the purpose of the research, the significance of the study, my theoretical frameworks, and of course, my methodology. And under this methodology, I will discuss the data sources and selection, sampling, recruitment, the Aita women healers, talking circle, data collection, data analysis and coding, the findings and conclusion. It is a very, very long ag agenda, but I promise uh, Dr. Barcelos that the moment we reach 9.50, I will cut of my presentation because again um i would like to hear your comments i would like to hear your questions and i would love to discuss uh um, this study more in details based on the questions that you have so i'll make sure that by 9 50 i will I, I will stop my presentation or finish my presentation so um i grew up in cagayan valley near aita community <clears throat> It is still not forgotten of those times when my mother would take me for a visit to the Aita community to play, enjoy meals, share stories, and exchange gifts with their children. I learned from their own that life was a gift shared with each other in ways that remind us of our interconnected vulnerabilities, relationality, and humaneness. To seemingly look vulnerable in the eyes of the other was a ways of reminding us of our human self that cannot stand without the other. 
This aspect of integrating me with the community provided me with a requisite route toward defining my axiological, ontological, methodologies, and epistemological perspective towards this study. This is speak of research as based on in these histories, values, realities, and ways of being is to claim that research is political. This political claim is to affirm that research should be grounded within community ways of life. So much of what I gloss in academic literature as the history of Aita people mirrors the tactical abuses and Eurocentric gaze found in accounts constructed from stern perspective, which where I argue Eurocentric and frequently explicitly or tacitly racist. Aita people are surely not unique in this experience. Thus, it may be argued to be a moral category of experiences when describing the effects of Western colonization on the indigenous people. It is difficult, for example, to read the 10,000 pages of the Ro Royal Commission on Aboriginal People that gives testimony of the experiences of personal and collective brutalization, residential school and theft of children, appropriation and destruction of lands and customs and other inhumanities without emotions. Similarly, experiences occurred across the globe, from Africa to Asia, South America and beyond, to virtually all of what I now call the inhabited world. The experiences are always unique to the people experiencing them, but they are scarcely unique when considered in their, in their entirety. The Aita in general, including their women healers who participated in the talking circle, are a case study in the interactive dynamics between oppression and liberation, inhumanity and irrepressible parts of humanity, which resist this form of repression. So in Kajayan, <clears throat> they call indigenous people Aita or Agai. In this study, the name Aita is used. The Aita people are situated in the northern part of Luzon. They are located at the foothill of the steep mountain on the western side of Sierra Madre. Historically, the Aita were transitory, practicing swindling agriculture. They built temporary shelters that were made of banana leaves. They would stay in such a place, using it as a hunting center for a week. And they would leave to go to another area of the forest. <clears throat> However, the Aita group in Cagayan is different <clears throat> Excuse me. because they have been residing in this place longer than other Aita groups. Their ancestors opted to occupy this place. This traditional territor territoriality is why the Aita people have stayed until now and excused pregnation. They believe that, I that Cagayan is where their ancestral terrain is located. This is where their ancestors were buried and where they practice their culture and traditions. This is also the place where they continue their healing practices following in the footsteps of their ancestors. Their extensive healing knowledge is well known in both their community and in other communities in the province of Cagayan Valley. The Aita are well respected by their own people. Their community has been recognized for the work they have been doing. They are consulted in times of tribulation. They have been called upon to make major decisions for their community and their healing practices remain in existence despite the presence of Western style health centers and public health practitioners in their community. They choose to use their own healing practices to cure their people. They share their knowledge of healing with others. They continue to apply their healing practices despite the dehumanization that they have suffered from the public health community at national level. So the Aita women healers believe in themselves and their belief is a strong force in the maintenance of their identity. They believe in, their efficacy, in the efficacy of their healing knowledge despite the continuing disruption by the Aita and non-Aita people. So this doctoral study aimed at providing historical evidence of the healing power of Aita women healers in the Philippines and how they use their healing practices as a form of resistance against imperialism. Aita women healers have been employing their oral tradition to transmit their cultural and 
healing practices. Aita women healers know that society is changing and that they need to start having written materials that relate to their culture and healing practices. As, a, as both a means of reaching out to the people outside of their community and as a means of sustaining their knowledge. So they know that non-Aita people need to get to know them in order to change the perception of the Aita people and that of other indigenous peoples in the world. This, however, does not mean that they are leaving behind their oral traditions, but instead illustrates that culture and traditions are fluid. They are still practice their oral traditions within their community. It is also important to have a written record of the Aita healing practices as a means of raising awareness among the Aita community in both the Philippines and globally. A written record will bring one of the multiple and collective, collective readings of the world. So while foregrounding the his, historical legacy of Aita women healing practices, it is also in the Philippines, this study and divorce to campaign for the maintenance and sustenance of the knowledge of these women. As the colonizer used education as a tool in the dilapidation of their culture and practices, Aita women healers seek to use the same instrument to counter the act of colonization or colonialism. Again, the central research problem of study were what are the healing practices of uh, Aita women? What are the implications of healing practices of Aita women in the academic discourse? And uh, the purpose of the research was to explore the healing practices of Aita women. It was also to document the resiliency and agency elements that had contributed to the continuity of this knowledge. So the Aita women healers agencies related to economic, spiritual, social, political, and cultural factors. The research examined the different forms of resistance against the imposition of colonized knowledge and how Aita women healers negotiated their positions in a society that valued the knowledge of men over women. This research is important for the following reasons, and it focuses on the healing practices of Aita women healers and the lessons that we can learn from them. And again, it brings a new space of decolonization Aita women healers' contributions in the political and, acad and academic arena are thus highlighted. And even though there has been a growing number of scholarly works on the Aita people, a study of Aita women healers e and, and its implication for academic discourse is missing. And this study addresses that gap. And finally, this study shows how anti-colonial post-colonial and indigenous feminism theories can be used to understand the Aita and Filipino relations and how the theme of identity, agency, and representation inform the narratives of Aita women healers. So the study employed post-colonial, anti-colonial, and indigenous feminism theories. These frameworks are important to the research question because they serve as apparatus in the data gathering and an analysis in the end analysis processes. They expose the, they expose the denied and alienated subjectivity and agency, hence facilitating the de de decolonizing intervention. So that framework illuminate the important attributes of Aita women healers that have been excluded by historiographies. Moreover, they un uncover the implication of the Aita women healers with respect to the academy. So this study acknowledged the debate within post-colonial, anti-colonial and indigenous theories surrounding the use of language, theorizing indigenous people's lived experiences, politics and structures. There is a heavy dependence on <clears throat> textuality and idealism and academic power and authority with respect to language. This study, however, highlights the presence of the Aita women healers in the political, social, economic, cultural, and spiritual arenas. So the study recognized the crucial importance of both race and the history of colonialism in both an international feminist project and engagement with the contemporary social, political, economic, and cultural issues. Research methodologies. 
So research as a political process looks at how local context matter in the process of producing knowledge. This means that people's ways of life, their values, belief systems should take central role in the definition of knowledge production. So this means that knowledge production should not only be a process of rationalism, but, but rather a process that is ethical and geared towards humanizing those so defined as emotional and instinctual beings. As in an ethical process, research calls for reimagining the immeasurability of the other in ways we come to look at participants as beyond quantification metrics of science. So that means that rather than understanding the other, we come to visualize the other as human that is complex and beyond simplification that is science. So the act of researching and the other becomes a process beyond commodification and the production of the other in ways that makes <clears throat> researchers to disidentify with what they have been told as the only process of producing truth. So this means that research as an ethical process should imagine of knowledge production beyond the industrial processing and rationalizing of the other and instead think of ways in which we can do or we can de-industrialize de the process to accommodate other ways of truth as valid. And this means that history of communities should help researchers to validate the ways in which those communities come to know what they know and the values that tie to their social being. So these major conceptual frameworks of how of the how of research are fundamental aspect that I want to share with you in this presentation. Today, uh, I present to you the live experiences of Aita women healers in the Philippines. While doing that, I cannot fail to ask who am I to represent this community? The aspect of representation is political and needs deeper critical reflexivity for me to identify my ethical duties and responsibilities. Even though I grew up with a community, it is my prerogative to identify how insider, outsider politics play a complicated politics in the representation of the people we claim to represent. I therefore ask why I should be the one and whether I need to do the representation dance. I call this a dance since I should know by place in the dance, if at all, I am going to represent them and remain an ally. Allyship should and remain a kind of a complicated dance that makes somebody who like me lies within the borderline of insider and outsider. The border point is violent or only they who are ready to sit in its discomfort can dance within the complexities of this representation politics. First, being with a community does not give me a straight passport of such a cultural representation. This could be such an easy route to remove myself from such complexities that is cultural and ethical. While as a human, I may choose to remain in my comfort, I ask myself, what such comfort will continue to denigrate this community that I grew up with? My comfort and appearance are political since it disappears such communities. If I fail to represent such stories to you, I am implicated in the disappearance of the community. If I present their stories without critically nuancing their stories and who I am, I remain implicated. That said, I will reiterate that a representation of the lived experiences of Aita people does not mean they cannot present themselves. In fact, they have known how to present themselves even outside what has dominated rational Western representation of the self. This aspect points to the fact that while they may seemingly presented as docile and emotional, they use multiple ways of representation that go beyond dominant styling of presentation. I did this research 10 years ago, and I'm still agonizing and reflecting on how best I can ethically represent this work without denigrating and terrorizing this community. I was a doctoral student, and the goal was to undertake 
a research that would empower and help the community's self-determination. Such a determination of empowerment and self-determination is not without nuances. Who am I to empower them? What would that empowerment look like? If empowerment is bringing them to the center, how would that center look like? If that center is, white, is a white center, we could be now engaging with ethical prerogative and asking questions how such a single form of center may marginalize the margin margins where these communities have called home. So to speak of ethics and self-representation, we need to ask how self that is to represent has been created over time such that maybe representation of the self actually become representation of the other. That would mean that even stories given by they who we see as oppressed could be a, represent, a presentation of an account that is colonial and as such, we need to critically reflect and engage with the participant in ways that allow them to imagine of their place in reinventing colonial processes. So self-determination therefore become a process of reimagining research in ways that are not just provision of data to policymakers, but also how research become a process of mirroring communities in ways that come to raise awareness to colonial atrocities meted on them. So this would ethically and politically change the way in which we think of research such as communities come to be brought together by the mirror image reflected on them by the research. So this place honors on the research to unite and form coalition in ways that are non-violent and meant to bring change in the community through social capital. So the system knows exactly how to do this through laws, legislations, protocols, and other mechanisms of control especially for indigenous and marginalized group. And we have seen this happen in our society today. It is within this framework that I, that I argue that while research process has been a violent process of misrepresenting indigenous communities, indigenous communities continue to subvert such representation in ways that are non-violent and mean to disorganize the metrics of knowledge production to, through contextual arts such as healing practices. So the study applied a snowballing and purposive sampling. I applied purposive sampling because I wanted a specific experience as expressed, as expressed by the Aita women healers. I had to identify one healer, the elder who would then refer me to another healer who had similar experience, my recruitment. So on my trip to Cagayan, I brought with me my cousin and my niece. This was important since we, when you visit the community, they need to know your connections. Our first mission was to look for an elders who was the gatekeeper, who we explain our purpose for the visit. I introduced myself and explained to him of the nature of my study. So the hesitant at first later agreed to my request. That was after I explained to him that it was a requirement for my degree. I also informed him that I wanted to know about the healing practices of Aita women healers and the implications for the academy. He said it was an important piece of work and he gave me his blessings to meet the healers. And up to that point, it is now clear that while we may argue that we have the passport to research out communities, there's always ways in which the community resists our colonial entry into their communities. I am fluent in Ilocano, which is one of the dialect that they speak. This facilitated talking circle to the Aita healers. I met the Aita women healers in one of the houses where they were making bibinka or rice cake, boiling sweet potatoes and bananas. I was informed that this was their tradition. When it rains, they are not able to go to the farm to plant or gather vegetable or to go to the river to wash clothes. They usually make something for the whole community to eat as they gather and have a storytelling sessions. Their stories, it must be argued, are part and parcel of who they are and as, a, a, and as a researcher. 
I had to imagine how such re realities and values within Aita stories ground their ways of creating knowledge and producing their identities. So as a researcher, I had to know their claim that their storylines was a fundamental form of, of imagining their lives and how we were to produce knowledge. It was also clear that such narrative was dialogical and community-based. The act of cooking sweet potatoes became the central methodology of my study. Since they were cooking, they would have those, they would have those stories with, which lied within indigenous epistemologies. The Aita women healers welcome us. In fact, we were offered some of these rice cakes to eat. The act of offering the rice cake to us reminded me of vulnerability and human and human and humanism that should guide the how of doing research in the in the community. To that end, one can see how an exercise that was supposed to recruit members into the research process become an orientation into Aita indigenous way of life, which I affirm should guide my methodology. So the data collection, which is um, talking circle as a methodology and methodology, um, as a methodology, as a method and methodology. So as I was eating, they too asked me the purpose of my visit. I was then that I informed them about my study. They were very excited and agreed to share with me their healing practices. I presented them with consent form to sign, but before that they questioned what it entailed. This aspect for asking is a testament that while I may be representing their stories, it still remain a political process that confirm that this group <clears throat> is not docile and they have ways of resisting a colonial encroachment. To provide me with food before such an engagement present an art of resistance that humanizes ways of producing knowledge in ways that are dialogical and nonviolent. So in the research proposal, I had stated that I would be using a qualitative research methodology in the form of gathering information on life histories. However, this changed when I informed the Aita women healers. There were 12 Aita women healers who agreed to participate in my study. I asked them if they would be comfortable to be being interviewed individually. They informed me that they were more comfortable talking in a circle or in Ilocano. I'm not sure if this is the correct um, translation of talking circle in Ilocano, but uh, I believe it's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, nagbunkel tayo magsasarita. So then talking, me, uh, then talking to me alone. So hence I reframed the methodology and we use talking circle. And according to Martin, who is an Aboriginal scholar, believes that reframing research methodology means acknowledging the existence of indigenous people. So um, therefore it was right for me to reframe the research methodology according to what they wanted, their beliefs and their worldviews. So talking circle have both spiritual and cultural le relevance to indigenous people. The spiritual relevance of the talking circle has been explained by Prorok uh, Ernest, who states that it is rooted in traditional storytelling and religious ceremonies. It offers a place where stories of life experiences are shared in respectful, egalitarian and non-confrontational manner in a context of complete acceptance to by participants. So it is a place where everybody is accepted as, and not judged. Talking in a circle is part of the indigenous worldview and it also a circle of healing. And the Aita women healers state that as much as they can heal others, they need healing as well and they can do this in a talking circle. This is where they express the pains that they are currently experiencing. And according to Sing Singley, which is a pseudonym, one of the Aita women healers. I use pseudonym to protect the identity of indigenous women. Uh, she said, and she or she states that, you know, when I joined the talking circle, I feel good because in here I can talk about the abuse that, ex that I experienced outside my community. 
When I am in a circle, I share this story with others, pouring out all the emotions that I have inside. And for sure, it feels good. My group, referring to the Itawe Women Healers, tell me to not pay attention to those things. We know it hurts, but we have to remember that these people need enlightenment. That's what Singley said. So again, this methodology that was identified by the Aita Circle helped me understand their worldview with respect to social, political, spiritual, and economic life and governance. And as much as they experience challenges in their daily life because of the scarcity of resources and the continued domination of imperialism, the Aita remains strong as a community in facing the different adversaries in their daily lives. So the talking circle methodology and format allowed me to hear about their perspective on healing and implication in relation to academic discourse. The to this talking circle led me to critically reflect on my privileges, prestige and power and how this could be used to, to be used as oppressive tools in representing the agency and identity of the AITA women healers. So the talking circle uh, set a scope of seeing how the external world de demonizes the Aita women healers. It enabled me to provide representation from their perspective. This is because they allowed me to hear, to write about their knowledge on healing and its implication for the academy after internalizing the discussion. So in this, this, in this study, the research embarked on a new production of knowledge and the highlights that the healing practices of the Aita women. So again, the, the 12 Aita women healers uh, of the circle divided themselves into two groups. It's forming a talking circle. The classification and taxonomy were indigenous. They themselves identified who belonged to the different groups. There were thus four healers in its talking circle. They needed to divide and schedule the groups with logistical consideration because not all of the women were available at the same time. Some were busy, busy doing other things. So when we completed the grouping, they planned the dates when I would be able to hold talking circle with each group. I held the talking circle in the summer of 2010 with the first of three groups on July 16, the second on July 20, and the third on July 25. The Aita healers know that respect is key in a talking circle. It is a forum where patience is fundamental. Speaking and listening with the heart is an essential part on the talking circle. During this study, after the first speaker, anyone who was ready was allowed to respond. After the first round of responses, I asked the second questions and the same procedures allowed until the responses to all the questions posed were given. And its uh, circle in, uh, lasted approximately two hours. So the women did not encourage me to take down notes during the session or to record the conversation. Instead, they asked me to listen attentively and to join in on the conversation they told me that if I listen carefully, I would never forget what they told me because it would be in my heart and mind and I would carry it with me for the rest of my life. It is worth recalling methodologically that it's in fact a call to use all faculties and the fullest gaze to gather data. It is also useful for recall, to recall that writing has certainly no more than 7,000 of years of human history. So the Aita women or healers also told me that others who would sub subsequently listen to me would listen as if it was their voices that they are listening, that they were listening to. And furthermore, the women healers were emphatic that trying that to write down notes while they were speaking was ineffectual because at times whatever they would be telling me would not be able to translate it in, to be translated into words, but rather communicated through their actions. So I listen attentively and ask about their healing practices. We also about agency, identity, and representation. So uh, the, the study applied thematic coding. The research identified keywords that seem to repeatedly appear in a major discussion from the healer 
Such keywords help to group the healer's conversation in ways that help answer the research question. And this means that the healer's keywords must line with answer, answering the research question. And as such, any participant statement that did not fit within the keywords would automatically be eliminated. So that said, analysis was also guided by the data collection, ways that rather than me asking them close-ended questions, I also allowed them to in retrospect what they had said. So this process of differentiation of data collection and analysis in itself colonial, right? And marks those who do analysis as the expert and they who do, who data, whose data is collected as consumers and emotional beings. So this dualism is, is, is in terms of research process serve the capital in ways that analysis comes to be given more prominence in data collection. So become a process that is tourist and dehumanizing. So to, to decolonize such a process is to call in ways participants take central role in both collection and analysis of data that decolonize this dualism. So I would like to share with you some of the findings of this study. And like I said, um, it is a very, very long uh, study, but um, I'm, I'm just going to give you a very, uh, some of the findings that I have. And uh, like um, one of them is that in the talking seeker, I heard and I saw that the Aita women healers are totally different from the way they have been pictured in the text. And again, a pseudonym of an Aita woman uh, used here, Himai states that, and I quote, I love serving my family and my community. To me, when I do things for my family and my community, I feel good because I know that those little things that I do can help them. For example, when I cook, I'm not only cooking for my children and my husband, but I always make sure that I include the rest of my family. So for him, my serving her family and community is not only a responsibility, but also a means to help and change their situation. For her, a woman who can both serve her family and community possesses the strength and intelligence, and most of all, the power. She might consider herself fortunate because she has the power to make sure that the family and community are healthy. And she believes that if the family is healthy, then each of the members is able to carry out their respective responsibility. This is markedly improved their life. However, if the family or the community is not healthy because of their well-being is not attended to, each of them will deteriorate, initiating the, the demise of their race. He might feel very empowered by what she does. She was aware that other, other people criticize her and label her as an oppressed woman. However, she, she sees it from a different perspective. To her, no one can stop her. We can see that Himai is continue is, is countering the, la the label of third world women as oppressed and as the production of the third world women as a singular monolithic subject in some recent feminist texts. So essentializing third world women is a mistake because women in the third world are very diverse. There should be some recognition of these differences that exists within the larger community of women in the third world, and more especially the Aita indigenous women. So um, again, that is just one of my findings. And I, uh, the findings, um, some of the findings, uh, other findings of the study have been published in peer review journal and book chapters and like, for example, the discussion of power through the eyes of the margin, the politics of representation, indigenous healers experiences in the healthcare system, which I just wrote the other day, uh, talking about uh, the contribution of indigenous healers in the ongoing pandemic. And when you look at the news today, there are only, you know, the government is only considering about the knowledge of the public healthcare system. But I wonder if we consider the knowledge of indigenous people, what would it uh, look like that kind of addressing this pandemic today? So I uh, wrote, I just wrote this one the other day. So I know that uh, my time is up. In conclusion, I would like to, um, 
Um, ma'am, uh, okay po and... kayo. Let, uh, okay lang po na we you go over a little bit po para you can share with us your finding. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for that, Jasmine. I am just. I I really would like your um. You know, would like to hear some of the questions, or uh, I would like to engage more uh, on your perspective about this study. But um, we can talk more about the findings in our in, in our discussion. And thank you for that, uh, uh, Jasmine. So we therefore, so therefore, uh, to end this presentation, and again, this is not the end of me engaging this 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 uh, study. I would love to continue engaging to all of you because, again, um, as we look at the indigenous uh, situation at the moment, I heard the other day that uh, the government is issuing a deed of sale, deed of sale in terms of the ancestral land. However, when I think deeper about the deed of sale, it's very, very colonial. And I would love to engage deeper. Is that the only way we can acknowledge their presence in our system today? So I therefore call for an engaged process of engaging participants in research in ways that humanize and make them take control of their life through research, right? This helps mark research as critically reflexive and ready to mix the blood and the mincemeat in ways that go beyond the normalized process of making knowledge. So uh, through a critical reflexive research process, Research takes an ethical tangent in ways that identify everybody as having the power to produce knowledge. So ethical obligation is a fundamental necessity of any critically reflexive research. So as Levina would say, we come to engage with the face of the other in ways that mark us late. This means that the role of the researcher as the knower of the other is flawed and contradictory and steals the life out of communities. For researchers to be ethically and responsible, they will have to come to terms with the fact that they cannot understand the face of the other. Rather, they can only imagine and acknowledge the pain of the other. To do this, every researcher will have to kill with necropolitics, the urge to be the expert of the other. This means the death of self or the resurrection of another self that imagines others and their point of me. Thank you so much. Marami pong salamat. Thank you po again, uh, Dr. Torres, for that illuminating talk. So now um, we will open our open forum so anyone can ask questions. We have a few already. Um, some I've already answered, but just to um, announce it to the rest of the group, um, regarding your question about uh, will, will this recording be public, um, it will be posted on our YouTube channel and the link will be posted on our social media platforms soon. Um, just wait for our announcement. I'll also put it in the chat, or the links to our um, channels. Um, another person is asking, is there a document or PDF file of the study available? Do you have a specific link, uh, Dr. Torres, that you would like to recommend <clears throat> to the mm -hmm. audience? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jasmine, for facilitating this um, webinar. I do have the uh, link in fact, if you uh, type my name, Rose and Torres T space, which means Toronto space, just need to type the uh, Rose and Torres T das space, then my uh, my dissertation will um, pop up. So you can just see and read the whole dissertation, and um, also there are uh, there if you if you Google this time it's it's. It's uh, a technology era where you Google somebody. There's no more, you know, you can't uh, hide uh, your your identity. Most of the time, it's just come out in the internet. So sometimes you type my name and you see some of the publications. However, if you are interested in um, 
some of the publications that I have um, that I mentioned in this uh, in this presentation, which is I believe the politics of cultural representation is online. Um, the indigenous healers' experiences in the healthcare system is forthcoming. It's it, it's one in my uh, it's uh, in my uh, forthcoming book. The research methodologies, histories, issues, and tensions. It's in the book that I just that I co-edited um, with Dr. Janisha Nyaga. The uh, critical research methodologies, critical research methodologies, uh, ethics and responsibilities. The healing and well-being as tools of decolonization and social justice. Um, if you um, need, if you want to read this one, maybe I can forward it to um, Jasmine. However, I am. It's because of these um, copyright issues that we can't really share this kind of information if it's not under the library. It's usually we get this information through the library, right? I also published Rethinking Marx where I uh, argued that alienation, um, the way indigenous women look at alienation from the perspective of Marx is completely different. In fact, uh, for them, there's no such thing as alienation when they are healing because when they heal, they feel themselves. When they heal, they are more connected to the community. And when it, uh, and according to Marx, when you work, you feel disconnected from yourself. And when you go out and work in the factory, you feel disconnected to your family, to your community, because you're doing a, a, a work that is, that, it, that, that is not what you want. But for indigenous women, they do this healing because it's, what uh, you know, they, it, it makes them connect to the community and other people. And the transforming indigenous curriculum in the Philippines, I believe it's also online. So uh, in, those, in those publications, you can see some of the findings um, that I, uh, that I, uh, that I uh, have from this dissertation. Thank you, Paul, ma'am. Uh, another question is, out of curiosity, did you share the findings of the research to the community? If so, how was the experience? Yes. In fact, I share all the, the, the findings to the community and uh, some of them were very happy, but some of them uh, have this kind of, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's worry because they, they, they look at it in a very positive way. They said that it's good to have a written material that will discuss our real identities. I, I would say identities because their identities is fluid. We cannot, um, you know, label them as just because most of the time, because of the internalized colonialism, because of uh, internalized racism, we think that they are the other and we are the expert of this knowledge. And so because we are in the academy, we tend to think that we know more than they know. So uh, they're, one of their, let me say, reaction is they are, they are very happy that this kind of discussion is out there. And for sure, I've been uh, seeing many, uh, many uh, people from the Philippines, especially Quezon City, downloading my dissertation because I can see that in, 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 in our library. So I've seen many people and I'm really happy because, uh, but I don't, I, when I say I'm happy when they download my, my paper, it's not because I want them to just look at my paper. I want them to engage with what I have written because it is necessary. Because maybe the way I look at things may not necessarily the way you look at things. So for me, I'm happy that they are looking at this kind of um, written materials for us to engage deeper the situation of the indigenous people in the Philippines. Because like I said, um, as I continually looking at their situation, um, Filipinos are very implicated, implicated in the dehumanization of indigenous people in the Philippines. When I say implicated is that our contributions in, in, in their hardship, in their challenges that are facing right now, it's not about blaming the, Filipino, uh, the Filipinos. It's about the impact 
of colonization in our lives. And so we need to engage with that kind of lateral violence that we are doing with uh, the indigenous uh, people in the Philippines. Because if we, if we don't engage with, the way, with our values, with the way we look at them, then we continue excluding them, marginalizing them, and at some point uh, blaming them why they are living in supposedly a poor life. So therefore, um, I, I think that's that's what I want to uh, engage in this kind of discussion is, is that it's not the problem of indigenous or, or the Filipino people, because in when you read my thesis, I really implicate, even me, I implicated in this kind of atrocities that indigenous people are facing at the moment, because Without that, and learning those values about oh, what we have been reading in the textbook, and the reason why I started writing about in the Aita people, the, the, in fact, this this uh, thesis uh, is 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 has built upon from my uh, bachelor's degree thesis. I also wrote a bachelor's political science, which. Uh, by political science from the University of the Philippines. I wrote the um, popular, the role of Tabak uh, in popularizing the ancestral land of Aita people in Camachilas, Florida Blanca. So in that uh, thesis, it wasn't well analyzed, <laughs> but it was undergrad thesis. So I, re I realized I have more responsibility to, you know, to engage deeper in terms of their experiences in our society today. So that's the reason why I, uh, you know, I, 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 I wrote this, this, this dissertation. And I'm so happy that again, um, you created this venue webinar wherein I can share with you my experience in the indigenous community. Thank you, Po. So, yung uh, next question, Po, has there been a material benefit to the Aita community after the study has been published? In terms of material benefit, uh, in fact, the indigenous women are not focused on the material benefit. It's more on symbolic benefit. And that being said, is that when I say symbolic benefit, is that how the way we look at them, they want us to see them from their own perspective, not from our own colonial perspective. Because whether we look, we, we like it or not, you know, the, like for example, um, yesterday I was called to um, share my opinion regarding anti-Asian anti racism in Canada. Uh, this is a media house in uh, Toronto. So I was asked to, um, you know, give my opinion in terms of what is your, what is your, uh, or what is your explanation when a black man hitting an Asian woman, right? And so for me, that is a very, very, a very tricky, tricky thing to say, oh, to blame the other. We experience, we experience, we experience different racialization here. Aita indigenous people experience racial racialization here, even in the Philippines, right? Because of the color of their skin. So that is the reason why one of my argument in my thesis is that they ex experience racism because of the color of the skin. So if we focus on material benefits, then maybe we are, are doing a study that is um, that, that that is that is not really hitting the point. And when I say that is not really the, hitting the point, is that we have to go back to the history, and the history of colonization is important to look to, to go back to trace all the atrocities that indigenous women or the Indi or Aita people or indigenous people are experiencing today. We cannot just focus on the seeable things. We have to focus the unseeable and the unspeakable because that's where the, right, the real enemy here. Because like, again, if we focus on Duterte, although of course I am not 
giving an excuse of how Duterte demonizes women. But we have to go back to the history, the history of how colonization come to the Philippines and, you know, we start manipulating the way we think of ourselves, we start dehumanizing the way we think, the indigenous people, and making us believe that the only valid people are the white people, right? And make us believe that even ourselves are not as beautiful as other people because the color of our skin, the texture of our hair is not, uh, is not as the dominant uh, way, uh, definition of beauty. So therefore, for me, my intention of writing this dissertation is to contribute to the symbolic benefit. And that is, to go back to the real enemy. And the real enemy is the colonization and the ongoing colonization in the Philippines through laws, through policies, through education, right? Through education, through our values. This because this colonization has not stopped. There are ongoing manifestation of, of, of colonization in our lives. Even the way we think. Uh, we think we even the way we define feminism how do we define feminism from what perspective even the way we define indigenous feminism from what perspective we have to critically look at the way we define these things because otherwise we are excluding the indigenous women who has the only right to define their own feminism who am i to define their own feminism and who am i to again like i said to represent these indigenous women i do not have the right to do this one because it's them who know their own challenges it's them to know their own um, ways of life however my responsibility is to show and to have written materials that speak about their lively realities. Um, the next question naman po, can you please give us examples of indigenous healing practices? Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that question. I think that's a very, very important question. In fact, one of the, the indigenous healing practices is that you make a aloe vera. Uh, this is how this is how I, how I handled uh, uh, COVID nineteen at the moment. So if I feel if I have the symptoms of COVID nineteen, right? My only medication is, but I am not prescribing this to uh, to anybody. This is what I've learned from the Aita uh, Aita communities or Aita women healers. So if I have that kind of symptoms, for example, uh, body aches. Uh, headaches, what else? Um, colds, all these things. I, you know, I go to the store and buy these big, huge aloe vera leaves, right? Seed leaves or stems, and that I chop it into pieces. I mix it with uh, lemons, and in that, and, and also I mix it with honey, and through that I drink it. So from there I, I get better. So that that's one of the things that I've learned from them. And also uh, other uh, healing practices that I've learned from uh, indigenous people is, uh, you know, prayers. They pray, they connect with their ancestors. And through that connections, they will ask guidance, right? Guidance on, you know, the nature of the, of the, of the illnesses of, for example, of a person who went and asked for their help. And uh, through that, they can tell them, okay, one of the things that you should do is to have a better relationship with somebody else because illness that does not just come from food, but also it comes from the way we relate to others. So those are the things. There are more, there are more. But however, when you look at my dissertation, it wasn't only focusing on the healing practices. It focused on, on the engagement of the issues that they face. Because when I went to uh, talk, ask for their healing practices, in fact, they told me, you know, most of these healing practices, it has been said, we always share with them. However, what is important is 
the challenges that we face and how we look at these challenges and how do we think we address these challenges in a way that we can op open it for a deeper engagement. Thank you. So the next question is, how do you think your research can be applied in today's situation, especially in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic? How can we put forward the knowledge of Aita women healers and other indigenous communities in the pandemic discourse? Thank you for that question. That's a very, very good question for sure. Um, well, one of the things that I've done is uh, like, uh, I, I believe I just said a while ago is that I wrote a paper on, it is time to include in the discussion on how do we uh, address this pandemic from the perspective of indigenous people. <clears throat> and so therefore um, it's up to the public health. You know, my, uh, when you look at the public health is focused on uh, science. Of course, I, I will not totally and completely disregard science. And also indigenous people, they don't disregard the knowledge from the public health or sciences, they don't. In fact, what they want is to make, to have an engagement uh, between the, 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 the public health practitioners and the indigenous healers. However, I'm just hoping that public health can read or will even have time to read that, pub, that, that that dissertation in a way that they can open, you know, their uh, give, consult the indigenous healers because this time COVID-19 is, is, is a very complicated, uh, <clears throat> is a complicated thing that is not just coming from a very, from a simple discussion of, we need to have this and we need to have that. It's a combination of how do we engage everybody in addressing this COVID-19, because what am I go what whatever I'm doing, you will be affected. You may be in the Philippines, just me, but my action is really, really important in addressing this kind of pandemic. So the call for Aita people or the call of Aita women is that how do we uh, have a relationship where we can hear each other. How can we have that form of engagement where there is respect and reciprocity in terms of knowledge production? So the call of Aita people is that to include other ways of knowing. The call of Aita people is to include even your ways of knowing, Jasmine, is necessary in addressing this COVID-19, all of you who are listening to me right now, your ways of knowing is as valid as the ways of knowing of public health practitioners. So therefore, what is the call of Ita Women Healers is let's join force, let's build coalition in addressing this COVID-19. Let's have that form of allyship, an allyship that not only focus on 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 my on my uh, way of being uh, my way of working for you but it's an allyship that is formulated with different forms of knowing an allyship where we can hear each other listen to each other pay attention to the details that these details is also connected to uh, the larger the, the larger struggles that we are facing so i think it's very it's it's not as simple as we think but again the call of white people is how do we include everybody in understanding this pandemic because this pandemic is not as simple as we think it is deeper it is complicated it's more complex so the the, the only way to address this is to work together as a community not working for others but we have to work together in addressing this kind of pandemic thank you for before I move on to the next question for you, Dr. Torres, I just wanted to um, address one of the concerns of the participants regarding certificates. So since this is not an official training, but this is a public event, uh, we will not be issuing um, e-certificates. So anyway, um, the next question is, what are 
uh, the AITA community's views when it comes to the modern heating process? I guess you kind of um, answered this already, but if you have any other things to uh, add. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks uh, Jasmine. Well, their views in terms of modern ways of healing is they respect it. They respect modern ways of healing because like I said, there is also uh, importance of that modern ways of healing. These are the people who respect others for the call is to respect them as well, right? They said that it is stronger if we join force, if we join forces to, to deal with this kind of diseases that comes from a colonial uh, you know, way of treating others is we need forces from indigenous to, uh, the, to, to the colonized pr practitioners. So therefore they said they, we don't have, they do not have any problem with the public health practitioners. They only want uh, them to respect their healing practices in ways that they can, again, join together to deal with these kind of illnesses that we are facing right now. Thank you, Paul. So the next question is, how can the Filipinos in the diaspora find solidarity with the AITA community and healing practices? How can we create opportunities for decolonizing and indigenizing our healing practices in the diaspora? Uh, very good questions, uh, Jasmine. Um, one of the ways is what I'm doing right now and uh, sharing with all of you this study, and like I said, there's no arrival. I uh, one, in fact, I received a call from uh, one of the professor who is a professor in the United States, but uh, she is uh, engaging with the University of uh, the Philippines in Clark, in Clark, right? There is a University of the Philippines in Clark who wants to, um, I believe. Uh, Make us uh, include a, a, a curriculum in indigenous, indigenous, or how to integrate indigenous studies in the curriculum. And I've done that uh, here in Canada, integrating indigenous ways of life or indigenous knowledge in the curriculum. And in fact, like I, I, I said, I am not the expert of this. I know part of the ways of knowing of indigenous people. And um, the reason why I uh, emailed uh, uh, Pitan, Professor Pitan, all, I, all along I thought she is the uh, chair of the Center for Women's Studies at the University of the Philippines, but she, has, she told me that it's uh, Professor uh, Rowena Laguiles is because I want to have a conversation on how do we integrate indigenous, uh, you know, indigenous ways of life or indigenous epistemologies in the curriculum. It could be in the undergrad. And in fact, I, I also, uh, you know, I contacted the Department of Education uh, in the Philippines and asked them on I, to collaborate with them on integrating indigenous knowledge in the curriculum. And that was, uh, I am still waiting for the response. I also contacted, um, the ministry, I'm not, I'm not, I forgot the name, but it's the Ministry of Minority, Minority, Indigenous Minority in the Philippines. They are the one who issued the um, deed of sale, deed of sale uh, for Indigenous people for their ancestral land. So I contacted their office and I said, I, ha I have this study with Indigenous people. How can I work with you? Yeah, I'm calling for, I'm working, how can I work with your office? Because I don't want to say I can work for you. I do not have that expertise. And when I say, I, how can I work with you in the integration of uh, indigenous uh, knowledge or indigenous feminism, for example, in the, in the Center for Women's Studies, is that I'm, I'm asking if, how can I uh, contribute to that development or to that curriculum? And also how can we invite the indigenous women in, the, in that kind of engagement? Because again, we may have this kind of plan of integrating indigenous studies in the curriculum, our plan, but without the engagement 
of the indigenous people themselves, it is useless. So my 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 idea is, I I have this plan to engage to to have an engage to have that kind of engagement. But in addition to that plan, I would love to invite those indigenous people to come and speak with us and tell us what they really want in that integration. Do they really want to? to integrate their ways of life in the curriculum, because it is necessary, I believe, especially in the, in the elementary level, in the high school level, in the undergrad level. And for, of course, for the graduate level, it's, it's up to the person to focus on indigenous studies. But I believe that is a, a very, very important engagement that we need to do is to integrate indigenous studies in our curriculum, especially in the Philippines. Indigenous uh, people in the Philippines, uh, they don't need our help. They can help themselves. Uh, of course, that is a very political, that is a very political statement. But again, when I say that, I am acknowledging their agency. I am acknowledging their power that they too can can um, can uh, can address these challenges that they have. So that's that's. Um, I hope I answered that question, just me. Thank you, Paul. So the next question is. Um, if you want to start studying more about decolonization, especially here in the Philippines, are there books, people, resources that you can recommend? In the Philippines, uh, well, I can. Uh, there might I I um the the books that I have used. Uh, so I, I forgot that. So so Mito, I have some books. I can send it to you. Um, Jasmine, I can also, like I said, send you some of my publications, engagement of indigenous people. And also, um, I don't have many. I think uh, I have not, it, it's not, it, 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 it doesn't mean that there are no uh, publications. There are very, very many publications that are coming from Filipino scholars. I do not undermine the Filipino scholars, but uh, at the moment, I can't even, um, think of any at the moment. I, I think it's because I'm just so focused on my uh, study, but I, I'm sorry about that. And I believe Professor Marby Villaseran is focusing on decolonization. I would love to engage, uh, to, to have, uh, you know, to work with her in terms of decolonization. And of course, I, I and, and all other people, Dr. Versalles as well, because we need each other. I can't do this alone. I, you know, again, um, my 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 knowledge on this area is as much as I publish, I did the research on this. I still I'm still learning, and again, uh, there, there's no arrival. I I, I would like I, I I continue learning, and I would like to also hear from all of you. Thank you, Po. So we have one comment lang po, um, not really a question. And she just wants to share, Ms. Chell uh, from UPCWGS wants to share that uh, you, Dr. Torres, might want to consider contacting FLCD Department of the College of Home Economics. I like the indigenous knowledge as applied to child development. So since you're interested to partner with others. Oh, nice. Well, thank you. Yes, we, I'll, I'll, uh, let's do that. You can share with them my um, uh, email and we can, again, like I said, I hope that this is not the, uh, the first and last of our engagement. I, I, I wish that this pandemic is, uh, is not here. It ends so that, uh, you know, I can... Uh, one of these days come to to to, to the Philippines. Pero napakahirap, no? Wala pa kaming vaccine, right? So hopefully that, uh, let's hope for uh, this pandemic to, you know, I'm not sure what to say, but uh, praying for, you know, the best of, uh, you know, the, the cure. If, I, I'm not sure even the cure. I'm, I'm very, very uh, critical in terms of the word that I'm saying here because, again, coming from uh, using these words from a colonial uh, colonial uh, subject is, is is really political and very uh, problematic. So again, I, I, like I, I said, this is not the end. I would love to engage to all of you because we need each other to continue uh, addressing the, the challenges of women, of LGBTQ, 
of also of you know other racialized uh, people because we are uh, we are we are facing this kind of challenges and in fact um as i listen to some of the webinars from the center of women's studies i uh one of the questions that really struck me is uh, um, uh, it's a man asked a question is that how come that when we talk about feminism it's all about women 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 i remember that and uh, i i i we have what i what i uh, I was I was I was really concerned with that question. Concerned in a way that feminism is not for only for women. It's for all of us. Your feminism may not be my own feminism, but we need to acknowledge each other's feminism. Feminism is coming from a, from a multifaceted, uh, complex way. It's about. It's not just about women. It's not just about women. It's not just about men but it's all of us our enemy is not you my enemy is not a man is my your enemy is not is not uh other women but there is an enemy behind what we cannot see so i think the focus is what can how can we focus on the things that we can that we cannot see how can we go back to that history of colonization that ravages the life of indigenous people and lives of, in the, of, of women who are experiencing violence at the moment while we are talking, right, Jasmine? Thank you, Paul. So um, right now we have one last question, unless uh, there are still other people who want to add uh, another question. But if there are none already, I guess this one is our last one. So one of the problems with published studies with IP people is that they are usually behind a paywall and are not easily accessible to the public or all policy makers. Have you found ways of wider dissemination of your research? Yeah, I think that, um, thank you for that, uh, prof uh, Professor Vilja Seren. Uh, you are right, you are right. And uh, most of the time, um, my also concern is not all uh, not all reading materials are for indigenous people. They may write about indigenous people, but when you look at the you know the textuality or the meaning of those things, it's like they are helping the indigenous people. Which again, I am very very careful in um, prescribing. You know a material that is not for, uh, that is not really um, critical in nature. So I, I, I agree with you, uh, Professor Villaseran, that sometimes they are behind the paywall. And you are right, and I think that is one of our responsibility on how do we you know, create more scholarly work that can be shared to, you know, to students, to people who are interested in this kind of work. And, um, you know that's why uh, one of my again my engagement is how how can I engage students to write more from a critical perspective and try to implicate itself your contribution to the colonized you know colonized experiences of indigenous people. So again, again, um, if when we publish, it's also very political because the moment we publish, it's owned by a publisher. And so even this one is it's very, very problematic. The, the, pub, the publications is owned by, by a publisher where you cannot even share it, for example, to, to all of you because of the copyright issues, which is also very problematic. Uh, so I think my, my, um, my, uh, what I want to say is let's continue working together because our individual struggle is connected to a bigger struggle. So my call is, I hope that this is not the end of, uh, of this kind of engagement. I hope to see you all again in the future. I hope to engage with you with this kind of discussions, in, in, in discussion of uh, women. And I hope to also um, hear your perspective in terms of the situation of indigenous people in the Philippines. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Torres. And to all Thank the members. So yes, po. And to all the audience members po who sent in their questions. Now, for our closing remarks, let us call uh, UPCWGS Deputy Director for Research and Publication, Dr. Marby Villaseran. Hello. Um, good evening, na ba sa yo, Rose? <laughs> you know, I'm not aware of the time zone. No? Good evening. Um, Thank you for uh, for that talk. No, uh, I was the one who um, asked that question about the paywall. Because um, it was it's one of my concerns, Rene. Na parang um, naka knowledge block, no? Um, yung naka knowledge block itong research natin. Um, and it's not always that it it manages to trickle down into policies because nga of this paywall. No. Um, anyway. Uh, I would love to talk more with you um, about this no, uh, later on. So um, again, thank you, Rose, for this look at your research process with Philippine Indigenous Women Healers. Um, it's apparent that there, are, there is, through your research, you know, there's a recognition as well as a respect for the participants' agency and an effort to decolonize the research process through the destabilization of the Western idea that the researcher's knowledge is of primary importance or um, siya yung primary source of knowledge no, or interpreter um, of, of, of experience. Um, the research is also cognizant of indigenous people as knowledge producers in their own right. And I guess this avoids seeing indigenous participants as, cult as cultures frozen in time no? uh, without contemporary struggle, successes, aspirations, or rights. Mm -hmm. This actually rejects the rendering of indigenous people as inferior and not in sync with contemporary ideas of progress and success. So maybe this is why um, when you think about it, relations with them by government have mostly been prescriptive rather than consultative and collaborative. Um, it has also been noted no, in previous studies that the academe can be quite exploitative and quite colonizing when we use IPs as sources, mm -hmm. right? Um, for research, for teaching, for inspiration or material, even in creative work, without necessarily seeking to give back to the communities we mm -hmm. draw these resources from. Mm -hmm. um, so decolonizing, I hope the research process can hopefully lead um, us towards recognition of IP agency and giving them appropriate respect as knowledge producers, in the same way that we give respect diba, to people that in yes. idolize natin as producers yes. of knowledge. Yes. So um, this can result, um, I, as, as I mentioned before, I hope this can result in government programs that are inclusive and give due recognition to the lived experiences of IP people. So thank you again, Rose, for sharing your research process. And thank you, everyone, um, for joining us this morning um, in this very valuable and informative talk. Thank you so much, uh, Marby, and hope to uh, in talk to you in the future again. And uh, again, yes, thanks everyone. Thank you, Nazi. Thank you, uh, Jasmine. And to all of you, marami pong salamat sa inyong uh, pagdalo ngayong gabi sa akin at umaga sa inyo. Music